I decided I needed to get out of the big city for a while to search for cinema spoilers in the wild. So I hopped in my old Camino and I took off for the open road. It wasn't long before I took a left turn into the surreal. A fly landed on my arm and I got the shivers. The sounds of a typewriter filled my ears. And I was so tired I felt like I was in a dead zone. That's when my eyes caught the sight of a sign that said, Welcome to Cronenberg. Behind that sign was a place that was a dead ringer for home. As I pulled in the parking lot, I realized no matter where I go, I can always find the spoiler room. The Fly, yes, 1986. It's a welcome to Cronenberg episode here, folks, ladies and gentlemen. And once again, I have the fantastic Dawn with me to talk about Cronenberg films. She's been a mainstay here on this series, and so glad to have you back once again, Dawn. How are you doing? I am doing well. I am very happy to be talking about this movie. It was one of my early experiences with horror with Jeff Goldblum and Gina Davis and with Cronenberg. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me too, actually, this was uh, one of those where I, um, this was one of my first Cronenberg films actually as well. Uh, I think this one was, I saw just before rabid and I, I think I saw this in the theater. Actually, my, my, dad took me to see it so if i remember correctly and i didn't remember much outside of gold bloom and of course the fly makeup uh, <laughs> and the fly character um, in general so uh cronenberg bringing us a story uh that's a remake of uh, the fly which we actually covered on the show last year we we talked about it which kind of spurned uh which actually sparked the whole doing uh welcome to cronenberg series uh, after we talked about that, talked about the flying and went from there. So uh, it's come full circle here, July. Uh, and we talked July last time about uh, the original fly. So, Don, did you want to give the synopsis for the fly 1986? <laughs> <laughs> so we have, um, we are dropped into the middle of a conversation between Seth Brundle and Veronica, who is a journalist, but aha, Seth Brundle does not realize this at first. So he brings her back to his apartment to show her, show her the new exciting experiment that he's working on. Once he finds out that she's a journalist, um, he convinces her to, uh, he convinces her to, uh, have exclusive rights or somehow they get exclusive rights to write a book and his experiment is on teleportation. Teleportation? Yes, teleportation. <laughs> and they start out with this very, very sexy scene of her taking off her silk stocking for him to teleport. <laughs> and because of course, uh, Davis and Goldblum were dating at the time, it's pretty intense. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Great chemistry. Yeah. Anyhow, so they are working together to get this exclusive videotaping, blah, blah, blah. They get all intimate and stuff. And then Goldblum gets all jealous and drunk and teleports himself. Uh, but he has a surprise rider in his teleportation, which genetically splices him with a common house fly. Then all sorts of horrible things happen. Yes. And all sorts of traditionally <laughs> Cronenberg things happen. <laughs> yes, they do. And then even more bad things happen and Gina Davis kills Jeff Goldblum <laughs> and, and, and gives birth to um, a Cronenberg. Gives birth to a Cronenberg. Well, we well, don't. That's, that's a, that's a, that's a Rick and Morty reference too. Ah, because okay. in Rick and Morty, there's a whole separate dimension where the world is is uh, populated by what they call Cronenbergs. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, there. That's my <laughs> random aside. And my rambling, whatever. No, you, no, that's really well. That's a good depiction. That's a good description of this film. 
Um, you know, th this is one of those where it's another mainstream Cronenberg film, but I feel un uh, unlike the dead zone, which we discussed last month, uh -huh. this feels more like Cronenberg kind of getting back to his old self. Yes, it does. <laughs> uh in many ways now uh my my oldest sat with me on it um and he had some snark along with it and he he had some issues with the writing of the characters <laughs> as he should have he's a very and, clever boy he, he is a very clever boy and you know he was pointing it out and i'm like yeah because he said at its core the film is w with the relationship part with the characters and, and how they're written. Um, he's like, those, those were kind of standard <laughs> characters. And he's like, maybe it's because 25 or some years later now, you know, th 23, uh, 33 years later now or whatever, uh, you know, we've seen more of these characters naturally, but he said they were kind of generic. Uh, what do you what do you, what do you say about that, Don? As far as because he the geeky guy, you know, he wasn't feeling it at all, and he's like, yeah, he just thought this was really a kind of generic story uh, with the relationship I, and the characters. I agree, but I question whether because it was a uh, that that time period, and I and I'm sorry, I don't remember. Uh, when the um, this was, when the um, I know this was eighty six. Right. When did the Brat Pack movie, not the Brat Pack, the John Hughes movies, comes out? Came out, come out. That was mid eighties, early mid eighties. Yeah, that was mid eighties as well. Yeah. So you have you have your weird science, mm -hmm. and you have your uh, your pretty in pink. You have your geek developing. Your, your geek popularity developing at that time. So having a, but they're all kind of awkward, not very strong, certainly not sexy the way this Goldblum's character is, the way Seth Brundle is. Um, so yes, they're kind of generic characters, but it's also kind of the very beginning of turning that thought process to geeks aren't just 1980 Anthony Michael Hall. They are <laughs> Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> yeah. I mean, come on. They it have is... a statue of him. I, I from know. Jurassic Park now. It's it's a thing. Yes, I I, I know it's a thing. <laughs> so so it was looking back on it from from this perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're kind of generic. But looking at it from then, it was kind of new. It was, and, and and that's the thing is he he fully admitted that, uh, you know, it 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 could have been because of the time it came out, um, you know, how it could be new. Now he did appreciate a lot of the aesthetics and practical effects, which we'll get into in a minute. But uh, the, the you mentioned Jeff Goldblum, so let let's cover him first. Let's talk about him first. Our Seth Brundle. <laughs> Uh, he wasn't very covered in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you need a moment, Don? Do you, yeah, you know. <laughs> compose yourself a little bit again. <laughs> Is it getting warm over there? No. Uh, Better turn the fan up. <laughs> yes, you see a lot of Mr. Goldblum. Um, <laughs> our Seth Brundle. What do you think of our our scientist? Because th there's one there's one like a hole in this whole thing right in the beginning when they meet. She says she has to interview people. Does he just miss it or what? Because he seems surprised that she's a reporter and all that. And I know that he's supposed to be the clue the scientist, but that clueless. I really think he. I I really think he did miss it, and I really think that. He, I really think that he just missed it because, ooh, pretty girl talking to me wants to come back to my apartment. I, uh, yeah. So it was kind of a also didn't they a distraction yeah. thing? Also, they didn't didn't they uh, later on establish that he hadn't really been talking to anybody, like not even from the people who are paying him to do these experiments. Right. 
Although you're right, it's, it is a pretty big plot hole to miss for yeah. them to have missed. Yeah, because I mean, he meets her at this meeting. I mean, that's how we pretty much start out this film is him meeting her. We we just get right into it. Um, yes, <laughs> there's there's no lead up or anything. We and suddenly he's already taking her over, you know, to his place to see his his big pods. Um, <laughs> and it's like, wow, we, we moved quick. Now he is the geeky guy, but that caught me off guard. And so later on when she says, oh, well, I'm going to publish this and record it. And he's like, uh, uh no, I just, I, I wanted you to see my, you know, oh my God, no, you can't. Uh, <laughs> you know, and it just, it, it's, it was a bit glaring to me that he missed that, but, uh, his character is supposed to be awkward. He's supposed to be. Um, maybe a little bit of a representation of Cronenberg <laughs> in some way. I don't know. Uh, do you think Cronenberg is, is speaking a little bit uh, through our Brundle character? Maybe a little bit, but mm -hmm. not a whole lot. Mm -hmm. Is is so? Is Brundle though looking at him? He. This time around, we actually have a scientist, although he does, I guess, do bad things later because Cronenberg has this thing against doctors. He's not really a doctor, but we do still have a doctor doing bad things. He's just a doctor of science versus medicine. But is this main character kind of a, a Cronenberg standard, would you say, or, or is Seth Brundle a little bit deviation for Mr. Cronenberg? No, I definitely think he's a Cronenberg. If he doesn't, if he doesn't start out as a Cronenberg standard, he certainly evolves into one for a lot of reasons. <laughs> Namely, and not just, not just the fly. Jump ahead. No, go ahead. No, we're jumping mm -hmm. around. That's fine. We can jump around. Okay. That's fine. Fantastic. So, at the beginning, he's kind of naive and idealistic, and he's all sorts of excited about. Um, the uh, the experiment and ooh, there's a girl, pretty right. pretty girl. <laughs> um, then he gets he gets all the things, and then uh, he goes through and he actually does the experiment, which is kind of his uh, represent representative of his uh, metamorphosis. Not just so. There's a lot of things that 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 fusion of. Uh, Seth Brundle into Brundlefly uh, kind of uh, causes. Part of it is where I'm going with this into the standard Cronenberg uh, character is he becomes very intense. Like really what this reminded me of is those mm -hmm. characters from the, from Shivers. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. He yeah. becomes very intense, very, very sexual, very mm -hmm. uh, uncontrolled sexual, just like what was happening in Shivers. Right to the to the infected in Shivers. Yeah, that's or it's true. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and then of course there was the there's the like the theme of um, if it wasn't just that, there's also the a metaphor for drug addiction or sexual mm -hmm. addiction or whatever addiction there too. Um, possessiveness, women's rights, a lot of, a lot of the standard Cronenberg things, uh, complicated parental issues. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's that. I mean, he, instead of having different characters mm -hmm. to represent a lot of these traditional Cronenberg it's all in Seth Brundle. Yeah. He pretty much runs the gambit, uh, much like the Brundle turns into the eventual Brundle fly and, yeah. and the, the creepy, the character does evolve as well. And, and we see those Cronenberg esque traits come through all through him because I mean, we, we really only have three main characters in this film Two, really, if you boil down to it, I mean, there's, there's Brundle, yeah. There's Gina Davis's uh, Veronica, Veronica, and then her ex, who's also her boss. Oh my God, the ass! I wanted that character to die. <laughs> I, you know, I knew, I knew he wasn't going to, but 
oh, did I want that character to die every time I've watched it. Uh, yeah, watching it, he, you're, he's one you really want something bad and nasty to happen to, which eventually does. Uh, you know, it, It's funny because there you kind of have that staple story, and I know it's it's been throughout Hollywood, but it always seemed really evident in uh, relationship-type films where you had kind of a triangle or whatever of the uh, story of, and not just guy, girl, it could be the other way around too, of the past romantic relationship between boss and employee uh, was not a uncommon thing to show up, especially in these eighties films. Was it not at all? Yeah. Or not, or even uh, that at, or student and teacher or student and teacher. Yeah. I mean, and, and apparently they combined both because before they were boss and employee, he was her teacher. Yeah. So, so we, 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 we have this as well, which is actually a common theme in, in kind of dramatic films involving relationships. Uh, it, you see it crop up quite a bit, not even dramatic films, comedy films. Um, you know, uh, Michael J. Fox's secret of my success. Uh -huh. <laughs> There's all kinds of, uh, boss and employee relationships going on. And so, we have that common theme here between these two. And you mentioned women's rights, but we do have the subject of abortion comes up because yes, folks, this is the spoiler room. Our, our man, uh, Brundle who got drunk and combined, combined, com, uh, excuse me, combined with the fly. He finds himself invigorated new man. He, he is, and also driven, uh, especially by his obsessions and, and, and vices and, and specifically sexual drive is high in our Mr. And well, of course, some things happen with them before she realizes he's going to turn into a big mutant fly guy. Um, and I don't mean fly like, yo, man, you are fly. I mean, act, wow, that was white. Holy shit. That was white. Um, I mean, an actual fly guy. Pretty, 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 pretty fly for a white guy. Pretty fly for a white guy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, literally a fly for a white guy. Um, so, of course, she becomes impregnated and we get the subject of abortion, which, again, was another hot topic, especially oh in the mid 80s. Huh. Um, and, and, that <laughs> and that hasn't stopped. And it hasn't stopped. And it's still a hot topic today. But back then, it, re it it was becoming it really was coming to the forefront a lot in cinema, uh, the subject of abortion. And it had been in the past, but in, you know, and it'd been there for years. But it really, it, everywhere you turned, <laughs> a lot of times the subject was in the news, and so it was in your cinema as well. And here, how do you think Cronenberg handled that whole subject of abortion and and the way that was handled with her ex and? and her reaction and how she wanted it and how the doctor was handling. I mean, how do you think that whole segment there where she's talking about getting an abortion because she's afraid of having a fly baby. Um, okay, how do you think so that was I, have, I have chosen to interpret it this way. She was very clear on what she wanted and what she did not want. Uh, Stathis was very much, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure you don't want to wait for a, another day? Are you sure? Are you sure? She's like, no, this is my decision. And this is my body. This is what I'm doing. And I want it done now. So she was the one in charge, but she wasn't, she was telling him to facilitate it. So he, the fact that it was Stathis, the guy mm -hmm. was incidental. She was still in control of what was happening she was still the boss of what was happening. Her body, her choice, that was all there. I loved that. Now, as far as the rest of it, again, the doctor could have been any doctor. He yeah. did the same thing. And uh, Veronica was very much, nope, my body, my choice. This is how it's going to happen. I don't want it inside of me. I'm making this choice. I've right. thought about it. I know it's going to happen. This is what I want. I like how they handled that. So I'm okay with all that. Yes. I, I, but it, as far as how they handled um, a lot of the other stuff, oh, those dream sequences and the parent and the, and the implications of the parent stuff, that was fantastic too. Creepy, disturbing. <laughs> David Cronenberg as the surgeon, hearing his voice so calm and soothing. And uh, yeah, that yeah, was really disturbing. 
because we we get the subject of abortion, but it's all handled within the dream sequence. And uh -huh. she gives, yeah, Cronenberg. I knew I figured that was Cronenberg when it, when it was like he had the mask on, but you heard the voice and like, oh shit, is that Cronenberg? Because I forgot he had a cameo in it, and then I saw in the credits, I'm like, oh yeah, it is. Oh, uh, it is calm voice. Yeah, it was very disturbing, and she gives she gives birth to a larva, which. It's scary, creepy, ridiculous, and rather humorous all in one. Yep. Yep. And I think it was intended to be because he does that to mm -hmm. kind of take the, uh, to kind of make it so that it's not overly horrifying. Just. Right. It, it, it so was. He did the little creepy crawly larva things and shivers too. He did. It was he just did. enough over the top to be, to, to take some of the horror away. Right. I mean, it, it's an intense scene. She's going through things. You're like, holy crap, when he says, you've got to push. And you're like, oh, shit. And then it, it, he picks it up, and it's just this wiggly larva. And, and it's like, huge. It's like three feet long. <laughs> I know. It's like it's not even like a little baby larva that you can hold two hands. This thing is just massive. And to the point of it is just a little bit humorous. It, it's Jackie, and it's over the top. It's humorous. And yeah, you're right. I think he throws that in there because before that, you had about two to three minutes of some serious, heavy discussion and, and theme going on. Like you mentioned, her making the decision and her saying, I don't need a psych evaluation. I don't want this in here. You, you, you know, I don't want to have this baby because of this fear. And uh, yeah, you're right. It, that is kind of his way of, of adding that taking a little bit of the edge off before of course that also launches you into the final um uh, the whole final uh, uh third act of this film <laughs> which, yep. which gets crazy because we've seen uh old brundle turning more and more into brundle fly and <laughs> and his and his cabinet of uh what did he call it the the, the history of Seth yeah, Brundle. Yeah, the the, the his, his parts. Yes, all of his parts, uh, including his manhood at one point, which again we have <laughs> body parts in jars, which as I mentioned when I was talking with Andrew when we first uh, talked about his very first film, Cronenberg had a guy who had his body parts in jars. <laughs> so he's coming back to that. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, and it was funny because it, you know, like I said, this was my first film. So when I was saw it, and if people catch that episode, I just caught it going, "Holy crap, that's where that came from!" And where that, I mean, you do have a lot more. I think out of you know his previous, when you look at the Dead Zone, and he goes from that to this, this is really him going. That, that's a huge leap. It's a huge yeah. leap. I think you also have Videodrome in between there, but. Um, so it makes me wonder if he did the dead zone to get the money and to get the reputation and the clout in Hollywood so he could do, or was this not made in Hollywood? This was, this was filmed in Toronto that I know. Yeah, it was filmed in oh, Toronto. Was this a Hollywood film? I'm not sure if this was. Cause was this uh, a Hollywood, you know, like a major studio release, uh, um, but he was probably doing it. A, a, bet he did the dead zone so that he could get the clout <laughs> to do something more traditionally him makes you well it seems he, he you're making a point and we did talk about a little bit last time with the dead zone because he went from like uh doing a movie like uh rabid to a film called fast mm -hmm. company to then the brood to then Scanners, which is a little more Hollywood. Then he did Videodrome, which is a lot, is all kinds of Cronenberg. That same year, he then did The Dead Zone as well, which is not really Cronenberg, it's commercial. And then he got The Fly, which is once again, more Cronenberg. <laughs> so he's doing these yeah. films so he could do the films he wants to do, it almost feels like. Um, yeah. It, and the fly is kind of almost a statement where, as we mentioned before, it kind of starts out not quite so Cronenberg esque, but it it finishes full yeah. on David Cronenberg. It, it evolves. Um, 
it, it, it evolves, you know, maybe him kind of metaphorically uh, showing he's kind of evolving, you know, back to his roots a bit. Cause yeah, you get the jar body parts, you get the whole theme of what ends up happening with Brundle, because here's a guy who is an introvert. He gets motion sickness, which I loved. That was his motivation for creating teleportation. So, so since you brought that up, yeah. Um, motion sickness seems to be a thing with Goldblum characters. Think about how many movies he's been in that he has issues with motion sickness. And the one I'm thinking of immediately is Independence Day. Oh, yeah. But there's been more. Um, I'm drawing a blank. I should have written them all down, but I didn't. But I just, I only wrote down that motion. My note is motion sickness is a thing with Goldblum. And I didn't write down <laughs> the rest of it. I thought I'd remember. I'm terrible. It's, but yeah, I'm... it's it makes me wonder if he's actually got motion sickness and that's why it keeps coming up in his movies you know i would doubt it <laughs> i would doubt it at all because it seems a little almost too natural whenever it occurs you know he's mentioning it or it occurs i i i couldn't uh -huh. tell you at all but that'd be interesting to find out if if motion sickness is actually something uh gold bloom suffers from because it does you're right uh -huh. it does come up in in many of his films um so maybe that's that is him but uh, <laughs> but he, here you have this introvert guy who's do totally into science. And then he has this experience where he does the teleportation and suddenly he starts getting into spirituality, which I thought was interesting. Unless I was reading too much into it. What was he done? Because he starts talking about the, the, the flesh and which, unfortunately keeps throwing me back to hellraiser but still anyway uh he talks about the flesh and and you know experiencing the flesh and understanding the flesh and the the whole experience of the plasma spirit the spirit you know i mean am i off on this or he kind of has you are this absolutely you're absolutely right on this and that's what that's why i said this whole after he uh does the genetic fusion with the fly, mm -hmm. he, is, he metamorphosizes into something more, but it's not just one thing, it's everything. There's almost like there's hmm, so much happening in him right? because his, his entire physiology is changing and his, uh, his thought process is changing because it's, it's becoming insect-like and he's the different perspectives but flies don't philosophize no <laughs> so his brain is kind of but i think that because he's got the scientific brain it's changing it so that it goes in different directions which from a scientific perspective would be more philosophy i guess i mean in, in almost religious it would make sense because what is the opposite of of science, religion. religious faith. Right. So it makes sense that this alien fly would change his brain into something that would be the opposite, but, and yet in its own way, equally brilliant. Yes. Or am I, or am I giving this too much credit? <laughs> no, no, I think there's something there. I know there's, I think that's, that's valid in that um, he does, he, the fly changes more than just his physiology. It, it changes him completely in his experience. And this isn't the first time, too, where we've seen, I mean, okay, I'm throwing it out there and not saying the two films are similar at all. But if you get down to brass tacks, here we have science being such a drastic experience for the certain individual. It becomes a religious experience. And so in and itself it's almost a religion kind of like we've seen in 2001 in a way <laughs> i can see that yeah i mean i i hope i'm not reaching too far but i mean in 2001 you had science you had the scientists you know they it, it, and suddenly it was such an understand they suddenly get such what they think is an understanding of things that it blows their minds so much that it opens it up to something that is resembling a religious experience, though it is still based in science. <laughs> uh, which a lot of people, there's that debate of, 
is science its own religion in a way? In I mean, a way. What would you say? I mean, because I mean, I know it's fact in that, but it, you know, the follow following of certain methods and certain things, I guess, you know, you could. So, make- so the reason that I read, I read something once and, and it just really stuck with me. Mm-hmm. The reason that especially religion and any sort of, hmm, and, and don't take this the wrong way because I'm not meaning it as an insult, By but religion is religion and religious texts were have traditionally and historically been such a good way to teach is because it breaks things down into very simple very simple ways for the uneducated right um, or the the people who have not been educated yet to understand it, it's, it's the same with fiction any mm-hmm. sort of fiction it's easier to learn if you present it in a way that's more approachable whereas that it's easier to grasp science fiction than it is to grasp science it's because they're written totally different ways even though they're the same subject matter that's why belief can often turn into religious zealousy whereas science really can't because it's not dramatic enough right it, it, it's still grounded yes it, it it's still grounded and and that's what I think makes the Brundlefly character a little creepy in, in his understanding and his whole approach is because while he is kind of talking of experience the flesh and the plasma spirit and all that, there is some grounded science in what he's talking about yeah. within the film. But he's moved on to a different way of seeing it that's much more religion based than scientific based, which makes him which is what makes him so much more dangerous. He he's looking for ways to make up to force other ways to force other people to see what he is see what he sees and see what he's experiencing. Right. And the fact Whereas that- the pure science, he could never do that before. And and he just he has hit the point now to where before if he was a scientist before the the transformation before the fly incident he could maybe understand how people might not understand where he's coming from. In fact, he says it. You know, he's trying to present his project in a way that he feels she might be able to understand. You know, uh, not fully knowing his background, but at the same time, fully understanding and accepting that she may not get it before his experience but she's still willing to understand and then like you said after his experience and he gets more of the plasma spirit or i believe that's what he calls it the the or uh the the spirit plasma or i forgot the plasma pool um i yeah i I get exactly what you're saying you know so he's talking about that he can't under he's like He's like, how can you not accept what I'm telling you? You know what? You've got to do it. That's the only way. It's like, rather than saying, you know what? I get you don't understand and that's cool. All right. You know, I'm I'm glad you're humoring me at least and, and you're enjoying this to, okay, no, that's not acceptable that you don't understand what I'm saying. I'm going to make you experience what I am saying. Then you will grasp what I'm trying to communicate. You know, I mean, there's, I think there's a difference there with this character and and yeah, he becomes more of a zealot. He becomes more of a, uh, you know, like you said, I mean, at one point near the end where he's taking on, uh, where, where he kidnaps her, you know? So I, I, I just had to do a quick Google search. Yeah. Um, because I was very curious because we've, as we've been talking about the whole religious implications, there've actually been papers done on um, the fly and the dead zone regarding uh, Cronenberg's uh, religious implications of those two movies. Really? (laughs) There's multiple, uh, there's multiple articles on them. Yeah. Okay. Well, good to know we're not. I'm going to need to read those. (laughs) Well, it's good to know we're not off on our. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Sorry. I, I, that was no. a distraction that I had to follow. <laughs> no, I'm I'm glad you did because uh, that makes me does does make me feel better that uh we aren't far off on that those themes are in here. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean to the point of where he, 
goes just full just before he turns into full on fly guy. Um, the melting bits and such. Um, where all the bits fall off. Yeah, to the point of he has this idea, especially once he finds out she's pregnant, um, of them getting together and merging into one. And the thing is, the science is actually there for it, but he's gone so far over to the religious and the religious aspect of it that he's created that he, yeah. He, the, he, he could have used the technology he came up with to possibly cure himself. Uh -huh. you, you see it there. He has the concepts there. You're like, holy crap, he might actually be able to cure himself. That's why he set this up. And then you find out, no, this is not <laughs> why he set this up. He instead wants to create the ultimate perfect form in his eyes, which is fly man, wife, and child. It's his own version of the uh, Holy Trinity. Yes. Mother, father, and child. That's exactly where I was going with it. Is is yeah, he he comes up with his own idea of, of his own trinity. Um and be damned if anyone's going to try to stop him, like the the ex who's a oh, dick. The creepy creeper. The, the creepy ex who uh you know at one point during the movie said, Hey, I understand you're with Seth Brundle and you love him and all, but can we just have sex once in a while? Yes, yeah. folks, he, he actually says this at one point. So you don't feel too bad. And I mentioned that. So you don't feel too bad when good old Brundlefly uh, excretes his his uh, Brundle vomit and melts the dude's hand and ankle. <laughs> Brundle vomit. <laughs> I, I forgot what he called it. I don't know. <laughs> it's the amino, it's the acid, the stomach yeah. bile. Yes, yeah. it's, it's Brundle vomit. It's, it's Brundle Bobby because he's a fly and just like a fly he has to eat and flies don't have movable mouth parts so to speak so they 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 basically excrete enzyme on their food and then they suck it up and it turns out Brundle fly has to eat the same way in one of the more grotesque scenes in this yeah movie. yeah uh, we, but he needed a shower after that I'm sorry. That's, that scene. That scene annoyed me because if anybody walked into my apartment, if I ever went home and found an ex-boyfriend just showering in the middle of the day in my apartment, and his his excuse was, "Well, I felt dirty, so I thought I'd come over and have a shower." Yeah, I would do much worse than give him the hot scolding water than she did. Well, and and that where it leads in some of the writing for our character Veronica here is. You know, she's still employed under this boss who's her ex, who's a creeper, who's still trying to mac on her. Yes, I'm that old, folks. Look it up, those over under the age of 30. Uh, you know, he still wants to get with her, if nothing else. Yeah, he's got a key to her apartment yet. He just goes in there, and rather than her really being, like, outraged and get the hell out, throwing his naked ass out in the hall, <laughs> she's like, <sighs> damn it which means it's like not the first time this has happened yeah. you almost get that impression well, and and he was i mean even though he was kind of a even though he was a creepy creeper and even though he was a dick that i wanted to and a character that i really would have loved to see with much worse than a hand and a foot melted off um <laughs> he and he loved her yeah to the extent he was possible, that it was possible. And he was hurt by the fact that she moved on. That's right. not a justification for him being such a jerk. But he was he was really just a jerk. And he really didn't do any true harm. And when she needed him, he was actually there. He was a, so, true, he was a true 80s dick. Uh, yes. Dealing with the fact that she rejected him in the masculine, manly way that he couldn't, especially for the 80s. But you're right. There is, that's what's interesting about his character. Because as much as he's just this person, you're just like, yeah, melt his hand. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you do know it, Cronenberg sets him up enough so you do have at least a number of moments where you realize regardless of how much of an asshole this guy is he genuine genuinely cares for veronica yeah. at, and at the, its heart and, and he's never there's a difference between 
Okay, speaking of 80s movies, mm -hmm. there's a difference between, say, going to pull up, uh, what's a good one? Um, some kind of wonderful Craig Sheffer. Yes. His, his character, when he was being verbally abusive to Leah Thompson's character, that was malicious. That was mean. Yeah. But the Stathis character, when he was being mean, he wasn't being malicious and cruel. He was lashing out because he was hurt. And the words he used and the way he said them, you could tell the difference. Right. It, he wasn't. He was the way he executed some of that dialogue was not him saying it to hurt her. It was his only way or the way he, only way he knew how to express in his manly way how he was hurting because of what she did. If that makes sense. And and I like that their biggest confrontation was very public in a store, so it didn't get out of hand. It was still civil enough to be in a store. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I really, uh, what it comes down to is I really, regardless of the kind of generic characters or characters that became so generic, even regardless of whether they were in 1986, right. I really do like the way the story was told. And it also makes me wonder if the reason the characters were so kind of meh and ordinary, God, Ordinary man. Remember the main <laughs> character for Shivers? Yes. Joe Ordinary. Joe Same Ordinary. Deal. Yeah. Um, anyway, it's because he was focusing on the, pardon me, on the story and on the concepts rather than the characters. Yeah. He's, these are, the characters are his tools. It's not about them <laughs> specifically. They are just tools he is using to execute, to, to present his ideas or thoughts. It's, it's him talking through his characters or presenting his ideas through his characters, not making these characters their own, <laughs> basically. Uh -huh. uh, you're right. Exactly. You're right. Math, Astathis is his or Joe ordinary that you've had in nearly every one of these films. I mean, uh, yeah, you mentioned shivers. You had it rabid. You had it. The, the, the kind of just every guy. And then you have, <laughs> you know, in this case, uh -huh. Brundlefly, who is completely not, the ordinary yes. guy, you know. Um, oh wow, my brain just went there, but I am not fluid nor knowledgeable enough in psychology to even think about it. So uh, uh, I may not go there, but oh, I will. I'll bring it up and sound like a dummy. That's fine. It, it is maybe with the three characters here. Do we have a little bit of uh, was it a Freudian id, uh, ego, and what are the three? Uh, oh God! You know what I'm talking um, about. <laughs> yes. I, I I wish I knew more, but I I'm just I, I'm and super that. ego. Yeah, super and ego. And super ego. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I I should brought it, but do we have <laughs> not in the three separate characters? I wouldn't say, but you right. definitely have. You definitely have. Um you definitely can make it could make an argument for uh Seth Brundle um the, flowing through each of them and representing each individual one. Right. Okay, yeah, sure. So uh, maybe not each one of them being a representation but him taking that trip be, be, uh, between all three. Okay, I, I I was just it just hit me I'm like three trilogy though though we, you know, yeah, there's there's a there's a lot of there and there's other things that I didn't make notes on. I wish I would have taken better notes. Um, there were certain numbers in here too that meant things, but I'll be. Yeah. No, I yeah I, I mean there's I think representation in the numbers that are presented um, as well, um, and you do have the idea of three. I mean, we got our three main characters. We have. Uh, then it moves to the three of Brundlefly, you know, uh, Veronica and their baby. And I mean, it, it does travel through as well. He, he has three pods eventually. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, I'm sure. Well, he has the one pod that was his prototype. Right. And then he had the two pods that he was working with actively. Right. That, that were the upgrades, the better ones. Yeah. Right? You, you still had three there. I mean, yes, folks, I know, but that's, you know, 
that's what pe- people who love film do. We we like to read into things. <laughs> Maybe we're reading into too much. I don't know, but it, no, because it's, it's, three with the re- it fits in with the religious thing, and as we've already established through a, a superficial Google search, religion is a big deal, and this is definitely a, has religious. Right overtones undertones and blatantly in your face smacking you with the friggin' bible <laughs> yes so it's it is all over the the place especially the second half of the film after he has his experience uh then there's also you know just his actions in general what's interesting is um i found oh. that the the there was sexuality in here but in all honesty there is for what people might expect in the film and what we're describing a fairly lack of nudity or real intense sex scenes. In here. There really isn't. They're pretty, pretty mild. I mean, it, it is tame compared to what we have seen in bits and pieces in previous Cronenberg. For this. this is, you know, we get more of the old classic, they kiss, they embrace, we fade to the next day. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> more than once. Mm-hmm. You know, until we, it's interesting because actually now that we're talking about it and it just popped in my brain now. And yes, folks, this is how my brain works. I apologize. But um, in the beginning, that's how the love scenes are handled. But as the film moves along and he turns more into Brundlefly, we actually get more explicit scenes later on in the beginning where he's more looking. explicit, but still not horribly graphic. No, but I mean... At- by today's standards. Right. I, I, I say explicit as far as compared to what was in the beginning, because yes. it, the first two uh, love scenes, if you will, uh, and I'm using air quotes here, the love scenes with Veronica and Seth are handled in that kind of old school, you know, fade to black sort of thing. And the next day they're, they're embracing and, and they're, you know, uh, enjoying their love with each other and, and sharing feelings and such. And then, after he turns into the fly, we get a little bit more of a not, you know, different film, different handling. We see a little bit more of them in action um, because they're having a discussion about how he is like the Energizer Bunny. And she's just like, uh, you should like drink something. Or <laughs> and, and then there's the scene with the um, random woman he picks up when she says no to him. We're right. done. This is, I need a break. And then there's, you know, Jeff Goldblum's butt. And then there's Jeff Goldblum's butt, yes. <laughs> Which is interesting because I don't think many people address it, but he actually teleported again when he grabs her because he has that scene in the bar where he's all jazzed up on the fly juice. Um, and he he feels he can defeat anybody. So he sees a girl he likes because Veronica's like, yeah, no, dude, I can't with you right now. You're just, no, you smell. And you just vomited, <laughs> on, you just vomited on your donuts. I'm sorry. I just, I can't right now. Um, so <laughs> so that, it, that was later, but still. So he being rejected, he goes out and he, he, he finds a woman who he thinks can keep up with him. And he earns her by breaking her man's arm and taking her as the prize, which is such an awkward scene. Oh, yeah, very, man. very, very, it, and it very much points out how much he's changed and how he views the people around him as yeah. lesser. Yeah, he pretty much walks into the bar and looks at every one of them and going, I am higher than you, which is yep. a complete turnaround from the guy who we saw in the beginning who's trying to hide and not talk to anybody. Yep you know uh, um, so that's a, a great change of this character but it was still and, a and, bit... and that scene yeah, that go scene ahead. is a beautiful thing creepy but a beautiful thing it's the... always always disturbing to see people's bones shattering and poking out of the skin but it does has an act. it does it does so well and it, and it kind of leads to the you know kind of the thing i wanted to talk about that we have to absolutely talk about because it keeps coming up with our cronenberg films his use of practical effects and body horror and man has he refined it now because uh-huh. we get this scene where brundle oh brundle brundlefly 
uh, does, you know, you think this guy, he's going to fight this guy or do pool, but no, they do an arm wrestling match uh-huh. and they're arm wrestling and he breaks the dude's arm like right there to bust through the skin. And it looks so much like he really busted this guy's arm. I mean, the way it's edited and cut, it's so well done. And there are so many great practical effects. Don, would you say Cronenberg at this point in time now with all the films he's done really kind of has refined his, uh, his directing and, and handling of practical effects now. Definitely. And I didn't have an opportunity to watch the whole movie with commentary, mm-hmm. but I do know that during the commentary, he actually discusses if the film would have held up as well if he had used, and it's 1986. So there is a digit, not digital, but there is definitely other options than practical effects available at this time. Right. There are enhanced. I mean, we even get some of the computer graphics for 86 are actually pretty impressive in this film. It's 86 empire strikes back and star Trek have already had a couple movies. I mean, star Wars and star Trek have already had a couple movies out by this time. Yeah. So there is, there is precedence for uh, different kinds of effects, but he sticks with his, his his practical and it pays the heck off oh yeah because the film still holds up today all the effects still hold up today um they look (laughs) wild um Uh just impressively gory and graphic and And the nice thing go ahead what i like is it's a very slow simple process his his metamorphosis and you meant as you mentioned it, he went through the, the telepod twice. The first time he got the, the super strength and dexterity, mm-hmm. which he demonstrates by a series of gymnastics. <laughs> which I'm sure gets, you didn't mind. <laughs> and then he gets some skin blemishes. Yes. But then after he goes through the second time is when body parts start falling out. So that second time seems to be the real key for the uh, the spiral into uh, badness. I, I hadn't caught that, but you're right. Him him using again, which leads kind of to your drug addiction, uh, which you talked about earlier. Which you know he's used he he used it again, and he's like reinvigorated, and you get a nearly nude Jeff Goldblum with the woman who he quote unquote won after the competition um, and he's suddenly invigorated, but yeah, you're right. That's when his body parts really start falling off. I love the look of when, when his ear, when he knocked his <laughs> ear off. The and look on his face was fantastic. He, he knocks his ear off. And then at the same time, he, he pulls his fingernail off and it looks it just, everything looks so gooey and gritty and gory and visceral. And it's just, Oh, and then you've got Goldblum, who I thought acted really well under the makeup because he's got a lot of prosthetics at one point. Oh, yeah. You know, but I think what helps is his eyes because Goldblum has those eyes. Uh, Go ahead. Crazy wild eyes. Mm -hmm. He can get crazy wild eyes. And I think that really helps later on when he's just head to toe in prosthetics. I mean, Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that I'm always impressed with in this film is the fact of Cronenberg not shying away. I mean, with the film, I know it's a little bit bigger budget, bigger Hollywood film, but at the same time, he does not shy away or cut away to where we only see parts of, you know, Brundlefly or this. No, we had a number of points throughout this film get full body, metamorphosed Seth Brundle, which looks phenomenal. <laughs> And it's impressive that they did that full prosthetic and were able to pull it off because um, it didn't look like a suit to me. I mean, you you buy into it. Mm-hmm. And part of it, though, I think is is Goldblum's performance within that suit. Um, and, and yeah, I just I love the special effects in this. And then at the end, holy crap, Don, when he is shedding his entire human skin. What do you think of that whole sequence? <laughs> I thought it was really good. It, as I'm watching it, I 
realized because I hadn't seen it for several years. Right. Um, an embarrassing amount of years, actually. Um, as I'm watching it, I'm like, oh, well, I can see where Peter Jackson got some of his inspiration from <laughs> in his movie Dead Alive. Mm-hmm. When, you know, I can I can definitely, yeah, I could see the inspiration. I my my brain just kind of went to bazillion directions. I'm like, that's brilliant. <laughs> That was, and it, and again, it holds up so well, just like a, the practical effects, the puppetry or models or whatever the heck they used, the the costume design, the creature design, um, not just of the fly before it went into the telepod, but when it merged with the telepod. Right. Oh, and so heart-wrenching. How yeah. can you have, I, I love how he can, um, hmm, how he turned that whole situation from horrifying and, oh my God, she needs to just get away from him. Please. He needs to be destroyed to, oh my God, I can't, how can you, how can you shoot him in the head to destroy him? Because he's so pathetic and he needs to be saved, not destroyed. I love how Cronenberg handled that situation. Yeah. He, he handles this whole thing fantastically and (laughs) he takes this guy who eventually just uh, eventually you get the full on brundle fly, which looks phenomenal. Um, and you actually make him a bit sympathetic at the end to where there's just a tinge of you not wanting her to be the one to pull the shotgun trigger to blow his head off. And, and he grabs the barrel and puts it to his head. It's like, damn you. Did the, the it's like like i you want to hate brundlefly you're like yes finally he got fused with part of his pod damn it and okay so we're gonna have the ex-boyfriend finish him off okay no we don't she has to and she hesitates and then brundle takes that barrel and puts it to his head and you're just like dude yeah your your heart totally breaks you're suddenly yeah. suddenly you're like oh my god there's still a little bit of brundle left in the brundle fly and it makes his yep. death actually not the hans gruber jumping off uh dropped off of a building type of resolution but more of a could he have been saved <laughs> i mean you're but more of a but more of a King Kong falling off the Empire State Building. Yes. Kind of resolution. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, oh, definitely. Now that you mentioned it, yeah, that's a perfect example. That is. It was beauty that killed the beast. Killed the beast. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, Peter Jackson ruined that line for me by casting Jack Black in that role and having Jack Black deliver that line in the worst possible <laughs> manner he possibly could in that film but anyway i digress oh but yes the beauty that killed the beast um you you do get a little bit of sympathy at the end from brundlefly which yeah. again is cronenberg he's not he's not letting you get away with enjoying the death of brundlefly definitely i mean you really don't get by the end of that movie Everybody is a victim. There is not a bad guy. Everybody is a victim. Yeah. uh, I'm horrible with vocabulary. You and my wife are so much better with it, but there, there isn't a catharsis. Correct. For it. Good. Oh, good. I'm using that correctly there. You you don't get that catharsis. Like you tend to do with monster films or, 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 uh, you know, the action films of the 80s order where the big baddie dies. You don't have that catharsis. At the end, you're just like, wait, he was still inside the fly? Oh, shit, she just killed him. Oh, she still got the baby in him. Crap. I, oh, my God, these poor people. And then her ex with the, you know, he's going to have a limp. So, you know, <laughs> but maybe it'll ground him a little bit. Oh, wait, no. so kind of thinking about all this Mm -hmm. and again i i really hope that i remember to and have time to read some of these 
articles on the religious implication of these movies, but what do you think? And I'm just going to say this, and I don't know if I'm right, wrong, totally off base, but what do you think the message Cronenberg's trying to send here? Uh, you have your, your, your geek Seth Brundle falling in love with this woman. Then he gets, uh, he gets, turns into Brundle, metamorphosizes into Brundlefly, whether the, um, and let's go ahead and assume it's a religious thing, not a drug thing. Right. What do you think that spiral, the spiral into self-destruction is a message saying, uh, a, a message saying that if you uh, uh, rely too much on one way of viewing things, it'll lead to your self-destruction? I could see that. I could see that because Brundle, he was so obsessed with it. Um, the, I, yeah, because it, le- it will lead if you become too obsessed with any one thing because he became obsessed with his project and he became obsessed with her, which led to his downward spiral. Um, well, I, I mean, I mean, even that. more than that, mm-hmm. even more specific than that. While he was while he was only working with pure science, he was sane. He was safe. He was oh, reasonable. Yeah. The minute that the the science the, the the when he started to metamorphosize and it became a religious zeal, is when he began. This is when the spiral into insanity, madness, and destruction happened. Yeah, I I can see that. Yeah, I I mean losing. Taking on that belief made him <laughs> brought him his downward spiral, abandoning his yeah. and, abandoning and, his and real really- his scientific or realistic or grounded beliefs and abandoning those completely kind of led to his destruction. I can see that. And and this is really where I, I wish there were more people who would have had time to talk about this with us because I would have loved to have heard a different perspective on this Mm -hmm. because I, I don't, I, I know there's precedence for it. Otherwise there wouldn't be articles on it, but I would also (laughs) love somebody to pull me away from this view. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) Well, let's also not forget though, the kind of, if you want to start looking at messages that what started his kind of downward spiral was, he brought in uh, something new and different in this case of uh, Veronica into his life, <laughs> something he didn't have experience with. That's true. And so it was, it was emotion in general and the emotion of love and jealousy specifically. Right. His that lo- started the whole thing. Yes, because he wouldn't have hopped into the pod ahead of time and been careless and not noticed the fly in there had he not been jealous and drinking which he normally doesn't do but he had been jealous because of veronica because he thought veronica was still wanting to go back with her ex and that and that prompted him to that motivated him or triggered him to get in there because he was so unfamiliar with this new feelings he wasn't sure how to handle it, so he Im- he went to the raw Thank feelings. You. Huh? Thank you for giving me what I asked for, I, <laughs> pulling me away from that other viewpoint. You're welcome. <laughs> I f- I feel bad because it's kind of implying that you know love ruins a man, uh, <laughs> but you could see that message possibly as well because. But- no, no, it wasn't love that ruined him. It was jealousy that ruined jealousy, him. Jealousy, you're right. I'm sorry. Jealousy, yes. Yep. Jealousy. It was love that saved him at the end. True. Good good point. You're right. It was jealousy. It was it was distrust. Uh-huh. It was it was those feelings that can come up that end up coming up with people, especially when they first are getting into a relationship. Uh, so yeah, so there, there is possibly that statement too, about how, you know, if you give into those initial feelings, okay, let's go this route with it. I'm, I'm shallow as a puddle. So pardon me, but, um, you know, here he's got a relationship and it's a fresh relationship and they have this one kind of falling out and Brundle gives into 
all of those feelings rather than taking a step back and thinking about it. He just gives into the jealousy and mistrust. And that leads to his complete downfall. Yes. When he should have taken a step back, talked with her or whatnot, but the fact that he didn't ended up causing his destruction. So you can take that angle with it that, you know, giving into jealousy and mistrust within a relationship can lead not only to um, the relationship breaking up, but your loved one eventually destroying your fly head. Just putting that out there. <laughs> I love it. That's, that's, that's the actual story. Whereas all the subtext and director's intent, it's the difference of the fly and Cronenberg's the fly versus, yeah. which is also the difference between the shining and Kubrick's the shining. Yes. <laughs> Where Kubrick's The Shining is somehow about the the moon landing in, instead of a haunted hotel. <laughs> Which, okay, sure. <laughs> yeah, hey, I watched a documentary on it. There's an argument for it. It's nuts. And and The Fly is about exactly what you just said, the uh, right. jealousy leading to a man's downfall mm -hmm. and versus this whole religious... Subtext, yeah. You got them yeah, both yeah. running in here, though, with the Cronenberg film. I mean, oh, they're, God, yeah. you know, they're, they're both there. It's one of those where if you had a different director doing this, you would just have the one story. But it's Cronenberg. So he's going to work. Yep. Yeah. You're going to work all these Cronenberg things into here. Uh, <laughs> you know, which why this is a film that's still talked about today and why a lot of people just love the Brundlefly. Yes, um, as they should for for many reasons, you know, and maybe, you know, we got a little bit of influence in here as well for uh, who's it? Uh, Kafka's Metamorphosis. That, was that the author uh, for the short film, uh, short story, the, oh, the, yeah. uh, which a later which kind of brings things around again because later on we're going to talk about Naked Lunch in a few months, uh, which is totally <laughs> from that short film, but we have a bit of that here too. Uh, but again, it's Cronenberg, so we've got body horror whenever possible, except for maybe The Dead Zone. Uh, so, <laughs> Well, I, I think we'll wrap it up here, Don. Uh, always fun exploring Cronenberg with you. Uh, so now this is where we will uh, tell our fine folks we're leaving Cronenberg. We've hopped into our car again, and we're, we're driving away from Cronenberg for the month. What is a one thing that you take away with you as you leave Cronenberg's The Fly? <laughs> Don't get involved with a mad scientist. Hey, there you go. Uh, one thing I take away from David Cronenberg's The Fly as we drive away is uh, make sure you have a lot of mason jars handy. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> and formaldehyde. And formaldehyde, because you want to preserve <laughs> that stuff, and you want to make sure you got enough for all the body parts. Uh, so there you have it, folks. I hope you've enjoyed our discussion. Uh, it's always a pleasure, Don, to get your perspective. And now this is the part where you can license the shill. Uh, I know you do still have it out there, so why don't you tell folks where they can find your stuff at? Well, I'll mention... I'll mention it. Uh, you can sometimes find things occasionally updated, not often, but occasionally in the audience.net. But I'd rather pimp. I'd rather pimp on the uh, the Northeast Wisconsin or New Horror Film Fest happening in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, this October. Yes, yes, a fantastic uh, place. A fantastic place to have a great horror fest for the weekend. If you want coverage, check out specialmarkproductions.com or the YouTube channel. You can find my coverage I've done of the horror fests that have been in Oshkosh. I've done pretty much every horror film fest there since, uh, yeah, almost. Almost wow. the beginning, yeah. Since almost the beginning. And I missed the first year, but it's been about eight or nine years now. Yep. And located in beautiful downtown Oshkosh, Wisconsin, with historical, the historical Time Community Theater, down the street from wonderful little niche shops, uh, including one of Mark's favorites. <laughs> yes. The little record store. Yes, Eroding Winds, Eroding Winds White Record Store, uh, filmmaker 
Adam Bartlett uh, runs it. He actually moved locations. Now it's even closer in downtown. I can't wait to see the new shop. I haven't gotten a chance to get to Oshkosh yet, but so much great vinyl there. Um, I could mortgage my house with the amount of vinyl I want to buy from that shop. So <laughs> lots of great shops in Oshkosh, great theater, great independent film community that supports indie films, either fans of or makers of in that town. Um, and yeah, October, check it out. Well, great plug there, Don. Excellent. And yeah, if you're a fan of Cronenberg, you'll want to come to it because I'm sure you'll see at least one film that has his influence. Yes. yes. So there you have it, folks. Uh, make sure you check out our stuff too. Uh, links and such, all that in the body of this, as well as at specialmarkproductions.com. I hope you've enjoyed our latest Cronenberg episode. We will be coming up next month, our journey back to Cronenberg when we visit Dead Ringers. So you'll want to check that out, as well as all our other great episodes. And now, just say goodnight, Dawn. Good night. Hey, all my friends out there looking for more spoiler room goodness, then why don't you check out our brand new Patreon page, patreon.com slash specialmarkproductions, where you can get access to exclusive spoiler room episodes and a whole lot more. You can also find us on Facebook groups at SMPRD and on to Twitter at SpecialMarkPro. Let your voice be heard and let us know what you would like to see in the spoiler room, as well as just how we're doing in general. We appreciate your support and remember in the spoiler room, the conversation is fresh, but we do spoil the movies.